<laughs> um, if you weren't here at the last meeting, I'm Nathan Combs. I'm the manager of the Canales Water Conservancy District. Um, we are the sponsors of the grant to do this study, which is the Canales Cooperative Project. We can, we can go through that. Um, we had some questions at the last meeting. Um, we weren't real clear in how we explained maybe some of the organizations and what their roles are. Uh, so I'm not going to insult you like everybody can't read, but um, we were the second water conservancy district formed in the state. Um, in 1939, the Conservancy Act was passed. We were the second one formed in 1941 to be the host entity to help build a federal project, which was Plateau Reservoir. Um, the Conservancy Act, which is in the Colorado Revised Statutes, lays out these seven purposes for conservancy districts. Preventing floods, regulating stream channels, we can widen, deepen, or change them. Regulating the flow of streams with any kind of governance of automatic gates or diversions or anything else. Diverting, controlling, or eliminating water courses, either in part or in whole. Part of, number five is really long about all the projects and the benefits, but it comes out to, to build reservoirs, canals, levees, walls, embankments, bridges, or dams. We can conserve, utilize, develop, or dispose of water, whether agricultural, industrial, or municipal, when desirable, as part of a project which fulfills these outlined purposes. And then we can participate in the development of parks and recreational facilities within the boundaries of the district. So, if you want, it's CRS 372101 lays out what the role of the conservancy is. So the Kness Water Conservancy has a goal to help all of our water rights holders, whether municipal, ag, or industrial, do better in whatever they're doing. If our municipalities need help growing and need water issues, we help. If individuals need help with their water rights to determine, to expand, to make better definition or clarification of them, we help. If ditch companies do, if there's any kind of projects that can benefit, that's what we look for, are ways of reaching out to solve problems generally in the water world within the Conservancy District boundaries. Some of the things that we face here, we went over this last time, but if you're new to it, really the line that matters is that black line. If you watch that trend, that trend has, that's explaining snowpack. So we've got from 1912 to 2012, so that's 100 years on this. We've got more data, but this is the slide I put in here. It's what I found. So we've seen a decline. This is for the Canales, and this is where we measure where it comes in. This is above the influence of, of sprinklers or wells or diversions or anything else. This is at the top. We're seeing that kind of difference. This is for the San Antonio over here at Ortiz. And the black line, you can follow it on the same trend. This is the Los Pinos, again, at the gauging station over here at Ortiz, and you see the black line. So to see that, that's what it comes down to numerically. So the Kines has gone from an average of 265, now this is just the Kines River itself, not the whole system, of 265,000 to around 200,000. So it's a 25% decrease. San Antonio is seeing a 20% decrease and Los Pinos 17% increase. So overall in the last 100 years we've lost about 84,000 acre feet of inflow. That's just mother nature not working with us in snowpack or late summer range or whatever that is. Um, we have a compact with New Mexico, Texas and the country of Mexico. The Rio Grande Compact. It <coughs> fairly proportions the water between those four entities, the state of Colorado, New Mexico, Texas, and Mexico. It's a federal document that lays out how we divide that water. And it's on a percentage of what's available. So it, some compacts lay out a very specific number. Um, so like on the Colorado River, they have a compact that says they will deliver 75 million acre feet in 10 years. And that's it. So on average, they have to do 7.5 million acre feet a year, but at the end of every 10 years, there has to have been 75 million acre feet go to the lower basin states. Our compact is on proportion of what the snow provides. So we measure those upper indexes, Magoti, San Antonio, and the Los Pinos, to measure what's coming in, and then we owe a percentage of that, based on what the whole year will be, to New Mexico and Texas. 
That was signed in 1938, okay? That compact was signed and made law, if you will, in 1938. We ignored it. We had a lot of return flows. We had all flood irrigation everywhere. And so slowly, 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 we started falling behind on our obligation to those lower states. We got sued. The state of Colorado got sued in 1967, 68, and surprise, we lost. Um, and so from 1960 on, 1969 on, we got the mandate from the Division of Water Resources of the state of Colorado, and it came down, thou shalt make this compact whole every year without exception. You will pay your debt and your obligations. What we had to do, we had to start stopping diversions. We had to start curtailing head gates. So starting in 1969, we had to start taking even more water out of our river system to make sure it got to our La Salsas gauges where we measure that water to New Mexico. On average, since 1969, that has cost the Kness River system another 70,000 acre feet. There, like this, in, in 2018, we, we paid like nothing because we had nothing. 2018, we paid more water to New Mexico than the river ran this year. We paid 225,000 acre feet to New Mexico last year. Our river didn't even run that much this year. So it's a huge swing, but the average is, is that 70,000. So you have the 84,000 that we're missing from snow, add in 70,000 acre feet that we have to pass onto the compact. We are operating on significantly less water. So we can never argue with someone who says it's drier, it's not the same. You're right, it's not the same. But there's a lot of reasons for that. Um, so as a conservancy district, rather than kind of go in the fetal position and get in the corner and suck our thumbs, we thought, we're going to do something about this. We have got to be proactive and we've got to figure out how does agriculture remain viable here with these conditions that we have no control over. Okay. This is one of the things we did, the Kinesh Cooperative Project. It's a title for project for the exploration of community solutions to water use within the entire Kinesh River system. It's just the title of a project. It's not a new entity. It's not a new group. It's just the title of what we're doing on this project to look for those solutions <coughs> that would address those issues I brought up. It's wholly under the direction and administration of the Kinesh Water Conservancy District. There's a board of seven representatives that I work for and answer to to develop. And it makes it develop for solutions throughout the district. So a lot of the projects we do that are on that community level fall under their cooperative project. We also do grants and we do a lot of projects on individual ditches. We've done them on the 8 and 12, the 6 and 10. We've done them on the Sanford, the Ephraim, um, Manassa, Romero, the Magoti. We go and help them get grants and funds for those. And of course, those are titled under the ditches name, but the Kinesh Cooperative Project is not another entity, and I don't think I made that clear at the last one from some of the questions. So the Cooperative Project is just the, the title of what we're, of the project we're doing right now. So these are some of the issues that we've identified in addition to the less snowpack and the compact and the other things. The San Antonio River is acting different. Um, the runout we, uh, on, the, on the histogram, it's showing that the river is coming out two weeks earlier than it did 50 years ago. Okay? So the peak is coming out a lot earlier. So we have a less, the irrigation season usually hasn't started. Down here, the ground hasn't warmed up enough to make much use of it, so we're losing a lot more water on that San Antonio system without getting benefit of it. There's less of it, whether it's the San Antonio or the, or, or the Los Pinos, there's less of it to deal with. There are no facilities where we can retime that. It is what it is. It's the, it's the feast or famine of a wild river. We have no ability to control flood conditions. Last year, in 2017, we had water on the, over in the Lavatos. We, we had water on the roads. We had it on the bridges. We had it everywhere because we had no facility to slow it down. I mean, there was nothing we could do about it. Um, we... We, we can only get so much water out of the river on the head gates by the priority system, and they're still washing across and taking out county roads and everything else. Um, and then it's interesting, you go through that season of all this flood and this washout, and come July, everybody's burning up. 
Even with that huge amount of water that we got in 2017, we start burning up in July on that system. So, here are our options. What do you do about it? What do you do about it? I mean, obviously, we could do nothing. We could just say, well, that's the way it is. And just looking at the trend of less water, less water availability, and less ability to grow crops and stay in the market, that only takes us to one place, a fewer and fewer farmers. Or we could explore some solutions. One of the things we looked at was helping the Division of Water Resources. They are the ones that administer the head gates. They're the ones that tell us every day how much water's in the river and how much we can take out of the river. And so we were looking to see, could we help them come up with a different strategy of how they handle the San Antonio water, give them a variance on the irrigation season, or when the timing of the compact gets paid, or how those priority systems work. We also looked, is there a chance for a channel that could connect the canals, um, well it'd be right over here on the other side of the highway, to the San Antonio, so that they could have some of the lower basin would have some of the access to Platoro. Could we capture flood for later use, compact, and for later irrigation? When we identify all of the problems, when we put them all into the bowl, really the only one solution that can help us in every one of those issues, the flooding, the retiming, the compact, is a reservoir. So we identified this, this is clear back in 2014. This happened in 2014 when we look at all the issues we're dealing with and we come to the conclusion, the most likely solution that benefits the most people is a reservoir for these reasons. I can tell you um, every reservoir is run different depending on who administers it and who manages it. We run Platoral on the Kinez. Um It's really high in the basin. Uh, I'm sure all of you have been there. Um, it's the highest reservoir that the Bureau of Reclamation has built. It's not the highest reservoir in elevation that's ever been built, but it's the highest one the Bureau has ever built. And so we sit at just barely under 10,000 feet. Only 30% of the mountains that can drain snow into our system are above the plateau. The other 70% are in the channel and come down the South Fork, Elk Creek, and all that below. But even at that elevation, we can cut a third of the river out under flood conditions. We have the ability to retime water. We have, called it, we have what's called the direct flow decree. What happens is an individual water right holder on, on a priority on the river, they can choose that instead of taking the water out of their head gate, they can have it put in the reservoir. And then later in that same irrigation season, we re-release it when it's been most beneficial for the irrigator. So we can retime those flows. We have a lot of our water rights on the Kness that will store water and they can call it out clear through July, August, and September and finish the crops, get two cuttings, whatever they want to do. Compact compliance. We store water in Platoro for the state. So when there's a, imagine trying to hit the compact target perfectly every day, but not know what the whole year is going to bring. And so we need some cushions in there if we have to correct the compact. So we store water for the state. If they come up short, we can release their water out of Platoro, and it doesn't come out of anybody's head gate. It comes out of Platoro to pay the compact. Um, we're less subject to the wild swings of supply of the snowpack. We also have the ability to store long-term water. So on years like last year, which was our fourth worst recorded year, 2018 was our fourth worst, we had 6,000 acre feet to allocate to the irrigators out of the reservoir, divided by acre. So even though there wasn't direct flow water, we had another source where we could add water to the system. Um, the environmental benefits all around, so the riparian area is all along the corridor, the boundary of the reservoir or a river, all of those locations. There's a lot of wildlife, there's a lot of uh, animals, plants that benefit from that zone, from the grasses and the ferns. And I have no idea about environmental things, so I'm just speaking out of my mind. You're oh, wearing a green shirt. That's about as green as I get. <laughs> oh, can be managed for hatcheries and conservation pools. So in Platoro, when you build that pool of water, a certain amount of fish come in and they take up residence. And so then we also manage it to where there's a minimum. So no matter what, there's a protection for that layer of fish. 
A lot of reservoirs, because of what's upstream, can be designated fish hatcheries for like the cutthroats, for other native species of trout, and that happens in these reservoirs. So that then Depart uh, Parks and Wildlife can stock other streams from this pool that exists in reservoirs because they can become, they can be isolated from, it, from downstream invasive species. Um, of course there's the recreation, whether you fish or boat or swim or just watch the water, that, that's available. We looked, identifying all of the benefits that reservoirs can bring, our first option on the San Antonio system was we looked at your hill meadows. It's already there. It's very similar to Plattoro. It's high in the basin, but it already exists. We looked at, could we enlarge its capacity? Could it influence runoff timing, offset flood conditions, and affect the compact burden on our, on our water users? So all of those issues we identified, we measured them against Trahill Meadows. We did a two-year study of the wildlife, the, all of the fish, everything about it. This is what we found out. Expansion was possible. Colorado Parks and Wildlife owns Trahill Meadows. They were more than willing to come and work with us for an expansion to either build a new dam or raise the dam that existed. Um, we had, no, we had no environmental fatal flaws. That I mean, there were, there were no endangered species there that would be negatively impacted. We didn't have any fans, which are a wetland dynamic that's very specific and can't be replaced. And so that's a, that's a no-go. There were none of these stop signs identified for trail meadows. The problem was the runout on trail meadows is later even than the runout on the upper Kness. And so in none of our modeling could we significantly impact runoff timing. They would, of, of the, so we couldn't impact any flood scenarios. It was too high and had too small of a footprint to significantly affect any flooding conditions down here. The last one, that Federal Reserve water right, what that is, it's a water right that the federal government holds on all of their public lands in Colorado. And I don't know if it's out, is it the entire west or is it just it was in 2001 when that passed, right? Was it? So this basin is, is the first and one of just very few successful negotiated Federal Reserve water rights. Okay. So very specific to this basin. But what it says, if you go fishing above any reservoir or any ditch diversion, there's a certain amount of water you expect to be there. And even though the government has no plan of taking that water out of the stream, they have a right to expect that much water in that stream. So their water right is not, it's a reserved water right. It's, it's in, the, in the stream, they don't take it out, but they have an expectation that it exists there. And so there was a huge study, and what they did is they measured flows, average flows at all kinds of different places on all the rivers. The Rio Grande, the Kines, the Los Pinos, the San Antonio, all of La Jara, Alamosa, and at specific points, they designated what was called a quantifying point, which is at this location, on average, in this month, we need this much water. And, it, and, and so what that, what that means then is upstream of that quantifying point, you cannot do something that would adversely affect that flow average during that month. It's not that they're taking the water out, but they have an expectancy of a certain flow at that location. There are three quantifying points on the Los Pinos below Trey Hill Meadows. The way a direct flow decree works is instead of having that water run all the length of the river down to the head gates, that irrigator decides to leave it in the reservoir and call for it later. That immediately and negatively affects those quantifying points for the Federally Reserved Water Act. We could not change the dynamic of the river enough to put significant water in the reservoir without violating that federal water right. I mean, they don't care if we add more, we just can't diminish it. But that's the only way we can make a direct flow of water right work was to diminish flows at certain times to increase them at later times. So we, we came up against a management decision. They were all willing to negotiate with us. The Forest Service, all of them said, let's sit down and talk what this means. So. While it was there, it was a, this is a huge hurdle, okay? That was a huge hurdle, but they were willing to talk to us. Um, this is what, this is what we just talked about. That bottom line is really the one that matters. 
the report from that two-year study recommended that we study a lower basin site for possible reservoirs that could accomplish the goals because the, those flaws that Trail Meadows. This one, we already talked about, just look at the bottom one. That, that's, that's what made the decision. There was no scenario where we could add more than 2,000 acre feet capacity to Tree Hill Meadows. But the cost of buying the reservoir or expanding the dam and construction was prohibitive. You can't spend $21 million for 2,000 acre feet. Nobody can pay that off. And so we just could not pursue Tree Hill Meadows. We couldn't get enough bang for the buck. So we came to this meeting because we started looking at lower basin locations. The reason that Ortiz was looked at is because it was the first spot inside the state of Colorado. That's it. It was the highest location on the river and within the state of Colorado. That's what picks Ortiz. Um, we talked about going to some of these other, like uh, Canyoncito and some of the other, I got that right, right? <laughs> so we looked at going into some of these other locations. The quantifying points on the Los Pinos are just barely across the state line. So we still run up against that Federal Reserve water right issue. Um, building a reservoir in New Mexico brings up an issue. The Llano comes out of New Mexico, right? And so that water, and you guys know better than we do, there's a discrepancy between the water that New Mexico gets to take out of the Llano and what Colorado gets to take. Because they're different states with different laws. And so then when you build a reservoir into a different state, you're subject to that state's water administration. And right now, with the compact issue, the compact, it's, it's held since 1938, and nobody, nobody wants to take that thing back to court. Because nobody wins. And I know there's gonna be a lawyer in the room, but they're the ones that win in a situation like that. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um, because there, there's not a lot you can do. Um, the federal water right and the wilderness study area, just up, that's prohibitive. The language in that wilderness study area is no new construction. It's specific in that site location just south of the border. And then the other thing we brought up in the last meeting is we did the drone. I remember we talked about the drone that flew over to see the geologics of the area. Um, they're going to give us that data. In a month, that company wasn't able to compile everything and get us the, the raw data from what the drone found out. So. We, we're not ignoring the questions and the concerns that brought up. Right now, these are the things we found out about those other options we looked at. Okay? So, we haven't, it's not that we've done nothing. We've been doing other things, but we just haven't got all of the data from that drone. And looking at the hard stops of going into New Mexico on our other suggestions. Um, so, what we're looking at now is this project is sim and, and this is a study of a reservoir, wherever that can solve problems. And I, I think sometimes we get too hung up thinking that because we're doing a study that come hell or high water, something's happening to you. And this is not the case. This is a study to see, just like at Tree Hill Meadows, are there enough benefits to justify the cost of pursuing this option? That's what it is. We, we had to walk away from Drew Meadows because there weren't enough benefits. For the cost, it didn't work. So don't get hung up thinking that because someone's doing a study that it's done. <coughs> we, we believe so far there's an opportunity. But it, like we said, it has to be, at this point, a willing seller. Our board, when we presented this project and we started talking about pursuing this study, the, it was adamantly, and it's in the notes, it's in the minutes, even though the district has the ability to condemn or use eminent domain, they said, absolutely not. This has got to be a good project that everybody, to the best of their ability, can get behind. There will be no forced sales. There will be no um, condemnation of land. There won't be any of that. It has to be a willing seller for a willing buyer. And so literally... Anybody that doesn't want to sell land to make this happen is not forced to. There is no mechanism to, to squeeze anybody. Um, that being said, after the last meeting, I couldn't believe I was inundated with texts and emails, um, people asking questions I couldn't answer. 
and it all had to do with money. The point being, if this happens, we have to buy the land at the seller's or a marketable equal price. That's all there is to it. We, we don't, the buyer doesn't set the terms. They can walk away from the terms, but they don't set the terms. So a lot of the ideas that came up, I, I tell you, be creative. If, if you're interested, it doesn't have to be outright sales. There are sale and lease combinations. There are all kinds of ideas that could make the project still work. And we're open to suggestions of what it may look like. Maybe the reservoir isn't that big. Maybe it's bigger. We're still in the study phase, depending on what the input is and what it actually looks like. The be awares, that's something to look at. Any water has to be taken to, to water court for a change case. Because we're taking irrigation water and we're going to put it in a reservoir. That requires a court approved change of use, which is either storage or augmentation or whatever that end use is. There's a cost to that. Um, all change cases in the state of Colorado require what's a historical consumptive use analysis. And then, just for people that have reached out, I think all, all the communications are confidential because no commitments are made. In the exploration process of whether someone wants to sell or what that looks like, that is strictly confidential and it's non-binding. We are not signing contracts. We are not handing out checks. But we are asking people to come talk to us about what they think this looks like. I don't get to come in and say what your land is worth, what your water's worth. There has to be a fair market assessment of it. So that that so. I've got cards all over. My information is in the brochures. If you have any other questions on that, I would encourage you to reach out. Um, I, the, the point I want you to walk away with is that this is a study. It has tons of potential, but there's always a cost. There's, it, nothing works in a vacuum without downsides. We get that. We are asking if there's a possibility that there's a financial pay off for those that would be under the reservoir if it came to pass. We're not mandating it. We're not forcing it. We're just asking you to look at what it takes for you to consider it further. We want you to take away the idea. We're working for the whole river system. It's not to benefit any one or any less. Anybody below the reservoir to the confluence of the Kness and down, we think, would be available to participate in that direct flow decree. So it's all water rights would have a benefit of it. It's not targeted to any one. It's, it's, it has to be a community project. And so that's all we're asking for is, and, and we're not on the timeline. Our project has to end. We have to turn in a report because we got grant funds to be able to hire Dita Tally consultants to help us understand the questions we needed to ask, how to ask them, and what to present. That has a deadline. But the potential of the project does not. So, no one's pressured, no one's up against it. I mean, no, no bulldozers are not on the way. There's, there's, there's nothing happening right now. This is simply the study to see if what we believe that a reservoir in that location would work actually will work. Because we thought a reservoir at Trio Meadows would work. Turns out after you do all the math and the studies, it doesn't. So, we're still at the point right now, we don't have fatal flaws, but that's what we're looking for. So, um, that's, if you, if you don't have a card or a brochure, please take down my information, email, or phone. Um, we get to you as soon as I possibly can get back to you. I have um, the office phone, can receive messages. My cell phone, I don't, and I'm not going to fix that. Um, I figure I got a cell phone, try back. <laughs> um, so, if, if, are there any questions that we can answer for you? Timeline, what's the timeline? On what component? The whole project. What are you looking at? So the timeline on this study is, is May or June of this year. When? Just this May of this year. Just this phase. To finish the first the study. phase of this study. If, if you're asking for a timeline on like construction, 
So, so let's run the whole, the for the whole case, so, so the timeline for the whole project. Let's say, let's say tomorrow morning, I can't even get to the office because there's a line of people that are saying, okay, we're gonna sell, and all of their prices are reasonable. Well, then this project starts in a couple of years because we finish some of our environmental studies and we start. Far outside, this guy sells, and then in two years, this guy sells, and in two years, this guy sells, and in 20 years, we build a reservoir. I, mean, I, I can't tell you that because it's up to the individuals who own that land to decide. I'll tell you, we have the ability to um, get an assessor, not uh, an appraiser, I'm sorry, an appraiser to look at valuations on what that will look like so that everybody can get an idea of what it looks like to make decisions. We, we, are, we are so at the beginning of this, I, I don't know where the end is. But for us right now, it's in the find out. We need, we need the landowners. Um, to talk to us. What is it? Those numbers mean nothing other than for my reference. Just so you know, it doesn't have any categorical number. It's just so I can keep track of, if someone calls and says, I have this plot, I can keep track of who's communicated with us. But, like it, oh, <laughs> last meeting, I think everybody got a full taste that my butt ain't so good. So, um, nobody wanted to chew on it tonight. But, <laughs> The fact of the matter is, that's why I'm here. Whatever questions you have, whatever concerns, it's me. So before we get to chewing on you, well, I don't think anybody's going to. Just... I'm curious, <laughs> who all attended uh, the last meeting? Yeah. Just a show of hands. Yeah, some familiar faces. Mm -hmm. uh, we have lots of food here. Somebody came up to me at the last meeting and said, well, you fed the other group you met with them. You. So, uh, I want to recognize you, Bernadette, she's cooked up. We, we want to have uh, an opportunity for you to think about uh, questions or comments. Uh, but my wife has reminded me that change is hard unless it's your idea. Okay. So, and, and I agree with that. Change is hard. Any kind of change is hard unless it's your idea. So the district, and, and, I, and I want to recognize the district for their courage and their initiative to go and ask some questions and look for some alternatives. And that's what this study is, to look and investigate for opportunities. And, and I would think everybody has an opinion. Nick has shared his opinion with me <laughs> at, at the last meeting. But, but this uh, process is about... <coughs> Uh, listen, I've been called lots of things, a dreamer, I've been called Pollyanna, because I am an optimistic guy. And I have been a part of a big project at Rio Grande Reservoir that it, it took a long time, but it, it became a reality, and the benefits that come out. So what I'm asking is, can we dream a little bit? And, and I would challenge you with, say, what could this project, what, if, this, if we had to start with a concept, and that's what the brochure shows. So make sure if you get a brochure, you have to at least start somewhere with a vision. And then ask yourself, well, what could it, what could it do for me if, if there was a reservoir here, or if there was a reservoir there, or if there were agreements to be able to move water around. Now the direct flow storage decree took a long time on the Rio Grande. It didn't take quite as long on the Canaeus because people saw that there was a benefit in retiming water to hopefully have some water maybe for a second cutting of alfalfa. So this is really a process of dreaming and I was excited to be a part of this effort when I met with the board because it, it, it allows people to think about, well, what could it be, and what could the future look like? And, uh, Travis, excuse me, you need to say who you are and who you represent, because I don't yes. think you said that yet. Okay, I, I'm sorry, and I need to we back need to up a little bit. I'm Travis Smith. Somebody asked me at the last meeting if I was with the with the export people. <laughs> I, I live south of Del Norte, and, and, and I've been here a long time. 
uh, and I've been assisting the Canaeus District, uh, bring in a lot of funds, uh, my role on the Water Conservation Board. So uh, my future life, I managed an irrigation district up in center and ran the Rio Grande Reservoir and the Farmers Union Canal. I own irrigated ground south of Del Norte. Um, I know what drought feels like. But now I get to work uh, on projects like this and help people dream a little bit. Now that might sound a little goofy, but really that's what this first phase is, is about looking at a concept or looking at alternatives to plan for your future. And unless you have a vision, you know, something to at least focus on and to discuss, then it's just talk. So um, I, I just had to say that. Oh, yeah. um, the concept of a reservoir at Ortiz is a concept. And just like the Trujillo Meadows, and we were part of that, Dean Natale was part of that in the district, we thought it had lots of potential, but when you look at the fatal flaws and the costs and the benefits, that study gets us to this proposal. And so for the timeline, hopefully, people would say, you know, I think, I think this, is, uh, th this has some promise. We don't, it doesn't answer all the questions, but it would get to the next phase to do some more of the geotechnical work to really investigate if there's wetland issues and there's riparian issues, and then to really investigate what the opportunities of being able to retime water. I heard, listen, I, I, have, uh, I have an 1873 water right, but it's kind of junior on San Francisco Creek. If I had the ability to move the water around a little bit more, I might be interested. So, uh, listen, there's more to eat. <laughs> and let's give Bernadette a big hand. Well, I called her at 2 o'clock and she says she was still making tortillas. <laughs> but we wanted to uh, have this time now to uh, dream a How long did it take bit. to uh, get uh, the total uh, done and going? Two years. Two years? It was it started in, okay, okay, so let me back up. It was identified. So to, to, to draw up the compact, there was a big study done on the entire Rio Grande Basin from, to the, tip, study yeah, from the tip of the Rio Grande clear to Mexico. And they looked at all the water rights. And so in that study, it was identified that a reservoir near Platoro needed to be built, one near the state line needed built, um, Wagon Wheel Gap. There, um, there were, they, they identified that clear back in the, in the 30s, that reservoirs were the way this end of the basin would progress and be able to make more use of the water. Um, in 1938, um, the, we didn't have a mechanism to do that. 39, the Conservancy Act passed. In 41, the Conservancy was formed. Then World War II got going. All the funding dried up, and we couldn't start again until 49. So the plat Platoro was started in 49 and completed in 51. And so it, it, had been, it was identified for a long time, but there were other hiccups along the way that slowed it down. But it, it took three years to actually build the reservoir. So you're so. saying that uh, if this could go, uh, if this would be done in Ortiz and if everybody was in favor, it could be done in three, four years? Y yeah, I mean, because, okay, so some of the major, there's so much I don't know. I mean, I'm just a dirt clod. I mean, I, I'm a one-man show running the Conservancy District for the board, and so that's why we hire someone like Dina Tally. The, uh, that water consulting, they have experience in all facets. One of the things I do know is building a reservoir on public lands is super difficult because of the environmental impact studies, and there's a time constraint there. That's one of the other reasons we look for private property. It costs more to go on private property because you have to pay. That, that land has value, um, but it diminishes some of those studies and those federal requirements that are on those other lands. So. I don't know if I could tell you three to four years, but I can tell you it is significantly faster in a situation like this than if it was on federal land. And so the, the money, we have to form partnerships to come up with the money and just that, but then it's, it's then we go. Next. So, next. Is this study being conducted under federal grant? <coughs> Pardon? 
Is this a federal grant study? No. Well, this study is funded by the Colorado Water Conservation Board. Uh, and it comes out of the Colorado uh, Water Plan Grant Program to look at water supply issues, uh, community. Yeah. So, so the state allocated a lot of money for these types of studies, and we applied to that program. Go ahead. You brought up eminent domain authority. Who has the authority in that case? Is it the state as well? Well, the state always has it. A conserva it's granted to a conservancy district. In the 1939 Conservancy Act, it's given to them to condemn land and to use eminent domain on federal or state properties, railroads, rights of ways. The 37, but, 1937. Is it 37? It's 1937. Yeah, 1937. But it's, it's, if you look in the Colorado Water Law, and if you need, you can come by. I've got all the books. It, it, that's where that is. But, but just to make it clear, yeah, and I, I, heard you I know you brought up that question, but it is not on the table. Our board is not going down that road. And, and I think that's the right way. How, how do you say it's a community project when, you know, that, that doesn't work? So. Right. And at this time, it's probably not, but down the road, it might be an opportunity to expand it. I, I would think I, they, could, they could hire anybody but me. Right. My opinion is <laughs> no. I, I think it needs to always be willing seller, willing, willing buyer. I, I just think that's a better method. Even if there was expansion and stuff, I think. Now, if you're bordered to the reservoir, there's still an asset. And if you're looking for a market, there's still a market because there's water rights that would need to be acquired. And thing. I mean, like I said, the sky is the limit. Be creative. What can it do for you? We don't know all the options. You know your situation. You know your scenarios. Come talk to us. I mean, and you don't even have to like it. it, it we're not. We're not trying to sell you. We're just telling you what is out there. So, if that answers that question, we're yeah. You know, I mean, if you were to get down the road of pursuing this further, would there be any identification of the federal funds to support the construction? So this is me personally. The board has not made a decision, but I would like to stay away from federal funds. I would like this to be state and local partnerships for the simplicity. And I'll tell you, before I travel that side, knowing, I, we recently went to, to Denver on a tour of, do you know where Chatfield Reservoir is? It was built in the 70s up there. And they're trying an expansion project. And when they, when they started that project, they brought in partners from everywhere. Well, you have to to fund these things. And they brought in huge amounts of partners. And then once they were there and they needed expansion and they needed to do some reallocation of what the, what the capacity was, it cost them an additional $50 million just to comply with like regulations from those agencies. You know, and it, it wasn't that they were being hard noses about it. it, it was the agency requirements. And so we want to be really careful moving forward that we partner with the correct partners. I don't know, I don't know what that list is, but we want it to be real deliberate. And that's why I'm asking you, because I don't know if you go towards the federal funding, if you can get around the national environmental policy. I, I think if you did federal funding, you've got a whole yeah, host of constraints. Right. That's a good point. Well, and, uh, and the good federal point. funding requires that you turn the project over to one of the agencies, either the Corps of Engineers or the Bureau, Bureau of Reclamation, which just triples the cost of, of a project. And, and the word of bill comes out every year, the Western resource uh, funding for federal projects. But uh, I think the trend in Colorado is, is private funding or state funding with, with strong partners because we know that federal funding is, uh, just adds decades to, to a project. And it's kind of in the same line as not looking at a project on federal lands because you just get strung out. And that's where I'm going with it because if you're going to evaluate any of the landowners and value for their land to make it to it versus the cost of doing out federal land maybe complying with the so policy act, national environmental policy act, and the cost associated with that. Yeah. Where's the cut off? What's the difference? What's that cut off? So, so you're saying it's, it's probably worth looking at that just to see what the balance yes, is. Yes, the cost, yeah. the cost benefit ratio of, of the private I, land that acquisition. Makes sense. That makes sense. The, the so Platoro was built by the Bureau of Reclamation, and so the district bought operations and maintenance of it in '92, but they still own the facility. But we have exclusive operations and maintenance of it, so it's kind of like ours without all the liability. It's a pretty sweet position, but complying with the bureau is, it has its issues. 
But I, I think you've got a point. Everything has to cash flow for everybody. So if it might be worth bringing in partners, I, I don't know. We're, yeah. I, I like the idea. So uh, I, I'm kind of curious also on the water rights. Those of you that are here, how many have water rights on the San Antonio? About the Canadians. Oh, up real high. Somebody want to count here now? Two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. How many? That, that's that's on the San Antonio. Just on the San Antonio. There's twelve. <laughs> okay. And then maybe it's easier. Uh, those who have water rights, San Antonio and the Canaans together. Four. Did you have some, Nick? Did you? Have some? No. Oh, no. And, and then how many on the Canaans? One, two, three, four, five. So I think one of. How many on the Canaans? Just five. You know, when you start looking at the benefits of water administration and being able to run it through a reservoir and retime it and then Platoro for the Canaeus users. Uh, there's lots of different scenarios that you could examine to see what kind of benefits are there. And being able to practice those, here, now probably the biggest challenge, and Paul Clark knows that, is when you try to practice cooperative River administration between the users, you've got to get the division engineer's office to to uh, give their stamp of approval. But the direct flow storage program has shown that it, that it's a benefit for the Canadian users. But one of the other things that was attractive to me was you've got users on the San Antonio that have been paying assessments to the district the Canaeus Conservancy District, but may not have received benefits from the project and project storage. So it brings some equality to those who are paying assessments to the to the district. I don't know if that's an issue for you or not, but I I, I thought that that would be. Yes, yeah, since 1941, all across there has been paying. They get no access. So we're trying to help them. A very underserved segment of our water system. Has there been anybody in our teams that wants to sell already that you know of? Yes. And the ones that want to sell, is there any way you guys can just build a reservoir the ones that want to sell instead of spending it? <laughs> Trying to buy everybody out? So I, I guess it looks it depends on what that looks like. I mean we, we can't I mean we can't Put water here, not here, and then put water here. Yeah, just some geologic. But, but yeah, I mean, th that is absolutely an option. If you get a lot of people in one area, then we look at bu building levees yeah, and saying, so you know, in the 400 acres, maybe you're down to 200 or 100 or whatever. So, so, so we're looking at any option. That is an absolute valid point. Yeah. That it, we're not trying to say it's all or nothing, go for broke. Because we're trying to have the houses there. What you, you guys just going to offer them the value of the land? Or are you going okay, to so, so we're not offering. Like they got to relocate and Yeah, so we're not offering. So. They have to tell us what makes sense for them to be involved. We, we, it's not fair for us. I mean, it's not fair for me to come in and tell you what your house is worth and to tell you that, no, you don't have the history there. It doesn't mean what you think it means. I, I don't get to do that. But so, is somebody above you have the right to do that? No. No. No, I mean, no. Okay. Elliot is on our board, and he can verify the board is not looking to push, force, squeeze. There's no one above us. It is strictly a Kness Water Conservancy District project. Um, there's no state, federal person above us pushing it. We're that, looking. That's right. During the inception of, of this, when it came out, one of the things that was brought up initially was that you know we we are proud of our heritage. We, we come back, we, we go back years. And uh, that village, um, uh, one of the main points was it cannot be compromised. That village cannot be compromised. The church, that, um, that core, that beautiful corridor that goes through there. I said, if any of that reservoir is going to affect any of that, it is going to be, we might as well just stop right now. So there was a preliminary um, drone that just kind of uh, did some elevations in there. 
and it was determined early on that it would not affect that village. So uh, that was a real important point to even consider talking about it uh, from that point. So yeah. there's really no, no plans to expand north of the proposed boundaries, or east of the proposed boundaries that you guys have on there? East or west? West, west or west? west. west. Oh, we, well, so west would put us up on the hill, right? Is that, am I looking at that uh, right? So west so would be, so that would be... But you're going talking going this direction towards yeah. a little southwest? Yeah, towards the road. No, not really, because elevation-wise, I'll tell you, if you look at that map in the brochure, elevation-wise, to go that direction also pushes us down into this area across the state line. And we can't do, I mean, that, that is a hard no-go. I mean, we, we just don't have the ability to manage across state. It's been done in the past, with federal stuff, but we, we don't have that. So, well, it looks like there would be only maybe four or five families that will really be affected. Yeah, I mean, what would it be with? For, you know, like under the footprint of the, of the water, there's not that. Yeah, I hesitate to say there's not that many houses. <coughs> Anybody's house is important to them. I'm not, but that was one of the other reasons we looked at that is there's absolute displacement but it might be the minimal possible if a project like this goes forward what would that number be? well I don't know I think there's five houses that I know of I, I, I'm not out wandering and surveying but that I know of there's about five houses that would be affected I by the water seven houses and five families. is that what it is? Yeah. So. but there's 32 parcels that okay so I only marked off 32 because I couldn't I couldn't with the sharpie you know, and, and the water line, if you look at your brochure, it, it stays quite a bit away from all of this. This is where the church and all that is. Mm -hmm. So, I, I didn't, there's way more than the 32, but <coughs> I didn't have a fine tip charge. So that brings up property taxes for everybody on the west side. Well, I think it possibly could, yeah. Yeah. But now you have lakefront property now. And then are you offering any land exchanges or anything with those that are displaced in this current area? Um, well, we haven't started negotiating anything, but I, I, that would be I wouldn't take anything off the table because we haven't got down the road and negotiating, but if, if that's what somebody needed, I don't know why we would say no. I mean, uh, it, because it, there, I, I think if I'm hearing then what's behind that question is there might be someone who has a house there but doesn't have enough land, even at an exorbitant price, to start somewhere else. So if they needed assistance, I think that would be reasonable. I, I, I just think that that's, you'd have to do something like that. Um, like I said, we've been contacted from people willing to sell, but we have done no negotiations. And I, I'm telling you right now, I'm not taking anything off the table because I don't know what it looks like. And if anybody can come up with a solution that makes a project like this work, we're all ears. I mean. And I just want to assure you the talks that we've had in the board is that uh, you you all are the most important. We can't do anything without you all first really knowing and, and understanding it and, and if you all want to be on board, then we can go forward. We have something to, to talk about. And so don't ever feel like uh, some, somebody's trying to pull a wool over your eyes or anything like that, not at all. You, you all have always been the number one person or people that we that we uh, talked about initially, and that's several times every time we brought it up. It's the people of Ortiz. What can, can we can we uh, at least demonstrate how it will benefit them and the rest of of Subdistrict Three? But how is it going to benefit Ortiz? See that that's the thing is Three, for the people of Ortiz, it, it has yeah, to be a financial incentive. Ortiz, water, water won't. It has. No. You're, you're exactly right. That that's what we're saying. Yeah. If 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 they don't buy your property, they don't buy your water. That, that's right, yeah. I mean, and, and, and if you want to stay where you are farming as you are, nobody can take that away from you. I mean, the, you're, you're exactly right. If you are under what would be that footprint, it's got to make financial sense because you, either you've got to be able to move your farm somewhere else, like what you're talking about, move, or, or else you've got to want to do something else or want to sell. And if you want to stay there, then you stay there. I mean, out of the 30 right there, on the top of your head, how many agreed to sell are it? 
point this out. I can't talk to you about that yet because everything's confidential. Look at that other slide. <laughs> <laughs> so, yes, so at this point, I'm thinking that you're just probably looking for um, interested parties to let you know whether or not, because if we actually at this point maybe even made a proposal to sell in terms of dollars and cents, you're not ready to act or negotiate on it anyway. So we, we actually, we, we do. So you're ready to like do a transaction? We, we have the ability to move forward on financial transactions. We do. Okay. And then, what are your barriers for this happening? I mean, because I, I think for someone that has land willing to sell it, you know, and if we're being real frank here, it sounds to me like it's about a financial interest because of that displacement or whatever it is. Um, what are your barriers to seeing this happen? You don't want to tip your hand too soon. You know, you want to make sure that that because the appraisal value is going to be based on what previous transactions were done. So, you know, you want to make sure that you're getting kind of a comparable price to what somebody else is, maybe that's a better negotiator than you, so to speak. <laughs> okay, so, so I don't know all the specifics. I will tell you in a lot of transactions like this, what happens is as the negotiation goes forward, um, let's say you sell first. This is not a number, but let's say you sell for X amount of dollars and we make that deal. And then let's say Nick comes in and he's a better negotiator and we have to give him X and a half. Well then, there's always usually a trigger that says that we have to go back and give you the half again. So that and so you could people. write that, you'd be open to writing that to a contract? I can't say that, I'm not our lawyer. But I'm saying that's the way I've seen those in the past. I could imagine something like that working toward, in the end, it's all equitable. Understand, not everybody has the same water right. No, absolutely. Not everybody has, they're not bringing the same thing to the table. No, I'm looking and so, for equity, I guess. So, so the, the appraised say. value has to carry merit. I believe there has to be a premium because it's not the same as ag to ag. But I don't know what those are until we get people to the table, give us an idea before we start. Yeah, because I feel like we're kind of in a, in a crosshair in that you want people to let you know they're interested or not interested. And then you really don't know how interested you are to really kind of know what that value is. But yet, you can't move forward with the project unless you really know what the whole, or most of the whole So, so if somebody comes in and they're saying, okay, for a million dollars an acre, we say, well, this project isn't going to happen. Right. We could never get enough agricultural financial benefit out of it down the road to justify that. It has to be equitable for both of us. And so that's why I say, in the strictest, it has to be confidential, because I think we need to have open discussions without fear of setting a trend or being disclosed just for asking questions, because otherwise none of us can move forward, because we haven't done projects like this. And to, to, your, to your point, or the, that land has a value, and it has <coughs> to be recognized. And it's more than an ag to ag value. Well, and then so, there's also the difference between appraised price and what a buyer's willing to pay. You know, there's the real estate cost of it. So, and I guess I'm just trying to establish some norms for parity. Well, I would just offer, if there's a general interest in, in the proposal, there are some next steps that I think have to take place. And taking this footprint and doing the, the, the cost-benefit ratio. There, there's some geotechnical work that has to be done. There, there's uh, costs that have to be considered about material being moved. And, and I think for this phase, what the district is looking for is the willingness to go forward to answer some more of those questions. Uh, that's just my opinion, rather than negotiating and nailing down a price. I think there's still some questions that have to be answered. In my mind, this first phase was, is the community willing to go forward and with the concept to try to answer some more of those questions. It might be that there's not enough benefits for 600, uh, uh, six, six to 7,000 acres feet of benefit. It's just, um, that, that's kind of where I'm programmed here is that's the next step to look at the cost. Uh, and so like, benefit ratio. Moment, like he says, we'll have our study, this, this is a super high First good study. look. I mean, this is not drilling down into anything. This is conceptual. If, though, there's enough benefit and it looks like when this conclusion we don't have those fatal flaws like we found in Trail Meadows, then we go get the money, we do the next, like, more invasive 
surveying and geologics of more than just what a drone does. However, in a situation like this, so that people aren't just strung out for forever, I mean, there's always... There's options. There's yeah. options. You can pay for an option. That have benchmarks out in the future as, I mean, as more uh, stages is of the typical, we have, um, we have lawyers and engineers that can help us with that. Because I am I am I don't know. So I know you said you're waiting for the final report on the geological study. How would, when, when you expect it, and then how will you release it to the community so that we know that things are? So that's coming ready. from the that's coming from that drone flyover from the Division of Water sure. Resources. And as soon as um, the they can get that, work. yeah, and, you know, we have a. We have an environmental look at, at, uh, at the plants and make sure there's no little wetland issues. And as soon as we get that, we'll probably compile that into like an executive summary that really boils it down to the nuts and bolts because those will sure. come, you know. And then we can distribute that to the mailing list and the contact list that Nicole has been putting together. That's why I envision getting that out is everybody that's signed up or attended or expressed an interest, we can get that data out. Nick. Do you have a cost analysis for the construction, not including the purchase of the land for a, a dam of that size? Uh, okay, so the rule of thumb is four to five thousand per acre foot of storage. Now that's just a that's a starting point. And if you have the water right, if you have a a good reservoir site. You're talking about a significant amount of money. So if you're looking at 6,000 acre feet, you're talking close to 24 million. I mean, that's a project cost. Well, your cost analysis for the Trio Meadows was 21 million for five times the... For 2,000 acre feet? Yeah. For, it didn't work? Yeah. So There's no way to make that work? Well, it had, it had the environmental um, concerns. Uh, potential land exchange or permitting with the Forest Service, and then, of course, the Federal Reserve water rights, which is really a minimum in stream flow. Yeah. And it, it didn't it didn't allow the district to be able to move water up and down for its benefit. So um, that actually, there was two costs that came out of the Trujillo Meadow study. One was an, an enlargement at the existing site. One was a new reservoir moved upstream several hundred yards. So it's hard to apples and oranges when you're looking at construction, but um, that's kind of the rule of thumb, five or six, four to five, six thousand dollars an acre foot for new construction. Because so our district, and it's public information, our district runs its general fund on an annual budget at right around two hundred thousand dollars. So it's a loan and it's partnering and so then you have to be able to leverage that amount of money and you have to show enough benefit because of the water ability, you know. So the way Platoro was paid off is if you store water in Platoro, we charge for the space. You pay $3.60 uh, an acre foot to store your direct flow water. So then that brings in money to help us service that loan. And then also, like I was talking about that long-term storage where we can make an allocation, we sell that for $4.50 an acre foot. And then that helps, you know, all of that money goes back to pay those loans. And so, so it's not like we're sitting on a big old pile of money and just looking for places to put it. There's a whole process that we have to make synchronized to make it work. And I just said there is cost benefit for both locations. If there's a benefit of more storage in Trio Meadows, if the cost is significantly higher, we're not even talking about how much it's going to cost to provide landowners out of this area. Yeah. What's going to be the benefit? And you were to me. You're hitting it right on the head. That's where we are right now. We got to know from input where that number is going to come in. And without input from the landowners, there's the red, the dam construction. We've got an estimate on, but the rest of it, we, we, we're we're in the dark still. What are you looking at doing as far as if you did put the reservoir? Are you digging down? Are you moving some of the topsoil, the gravel? Um, so, so the preliminary, just look, when we, we took a geologist out to look at and say, are we crazy? They said that right, like for where the proposed dam site would be, you would have to excavate down there because there's a lot of sedimentation and gravel. 
take it down to the bedrock that connects those those two high banks on each side. Um, that dirt right there is what we planned on moving to make levees and things to ensure, like what Elliot said, the church is not the whole village of, of that of the main chain is not touched, not inundated. Um, so there's some of both. There's some leave it, and then there's some excavation required. It, it, from what we think, you know, we it would it'd be a combination of both. What would you do with the number three irrigation ditch that puts us under water the dam? So then we have to make sure that your water, where it comes out, I don't know if the cursor will work on this. Well, so where the water would cross, we would have to make sure you have the same flow and discharge there to service that. So even though, so we would have to go to court and get approval for an alternate point or a, a transfer of the point of conversion to at the dam or something like that. That would be the cost of the reservoir, not the water rights holders on the number three. So we would have to make sure that you were whole. Do you know what I mean? That you got your water in the same place. Say 17, it's not selling. 18, 27, and 15 are interstate. What does it do to it? And that's up against the, the wall that you guys need. There you go. That's what we're saying. This isn't, I mean, you know the answer to that. If they don't sell, the project doesn't go forward. This is a willing seller, willing buyer. But if you get enough of it, we wait or we look at other options. What is the dam? I mean, maybe we change the footprint. I mean, I don't know. I honestly don't know all the answers to the what ifs. Yes, sir. What happens to the water rights of the land you purchase? So, so those water rights would have to go to court and be changed um, for like augmentation so that what we do at like Tatoro is then that's what makes part of that water that um, pays evaporation because when we add a pool there's extra evaporation and that can't negatively impact the downstream so we part of that would have to stay there to cover evaporation the other part of it could come in to make a project allocation we keep it in the reservoir and then we distribute it um, equitably, equitably by acre to those downstream um, it, it could be, I mean, it's just the sky's the limit for those, but they have to be changed to something else. But those water rights have to be bought, changed, and then that's determined, depending on what, how much they are. I mean, if, if it's not much, it doesn't go very far, you know. Might, but that's might a good be designated point. For, for the recreational pool that might be there. There's all kinds of... It could be designated to be in-stream pool below. I mean, it, you know, to keep the river live, even though there's a dam, we may have to have releases to keep the fish and the river alive below. There's all kinds of, I mean, there's a lot of requirements of putting up a dam that aren't just about construction. They're about impacting the river and those water rights and keeping those whole. So that's where I envision most of that would go. If you bought those water rights as they would be changed to make it available for others or to cover the cost of the reservoir. What would you do to stop the and all that seepage, you know, I mean, what, what would you put in the base stuff with seepage? Well, that's what the geologic study will tell us. If, the, if there's a rock tight enough, we don't have to do anything. And if it's not tight enough, then we would have to look at what it would take to, to fix that. So, all right. Any other questions? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. What are you going to do with all the water rights? I think I do all this. All the water that you guys buy for the landowners, what are you guys going to do with it? Well, like I said, we'll have to, some of us to stay in the reservoir to pay evaporation, or it could be built up in the reservoir to make a quantity that then was divided by all the share, the water rights holders below on a yearly basis, you know, that they get extra water based on that. It could go to stay in the reservoir to make sure there's always fish or recreation. It could be used to make a river channel live to where there's always water in the channel below the reservoir. There's a lot of different options that we would have to comply well, with. You guys are going to sell it to the highest bidder. <laughs> yeah. Our job is to work for this basin, not. That's what they say, but what you do is to. Oh, I, 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 can, I can imagine. But yeah, we, we don't, we're not in the water rights marketing business. So is the, the grant going to pay for like the sense like the land value? The, the appraisers? The appraisers? So we've got some other, yeah. I mean, so we had to put some things in order 
to, to make sure this project could be finalized. And so the appraisal is at the district's cost, it's not at the landowner's. And so the grant is specific for the study and what it's going to take to make this project move forward. So we're trying to we're, we're trying to put everything we can. I guess I guess trying to prove our due diligence and the sincerity that we're not trying to we're trying to put our skin in the game too. So. Guys, question. Yes, sir. It's a reader question. How are we able to get information about these meetings? Second. Ranger Duran, who owns shares, is concerned he did not know of this meeting. So um, we've got a sign-up sheet, and we contacted everybody that the county has listed. We sent invitations to, and we'll continue down that process, I guess, actually. And if they don't sign up, they might not hear. Yeah, so, and the region is in Pueblo. But he's listed as a landowner. He should have got an invitation. Yeah, but we we, we sent him everybody. We got that down though. Yeah. yeah. So so we got a list from the county of the parcels and tracts, and sent that those invitations out. That's how we started it. So um, we'll we'll have some more meetings, but we're probably not going to have another meeting until we have some of the answers to some of these other questions, like the geologic study, and closer to what that environmental study will be, and then we can. I mean, tell your friends, tell your neighbors. We're not trying to. I mean, we're trying to get the information out to the interested parties. Yes, I'm sorry. Um, who's your appraiser? Are you just using one, like appraisal company? So we haven't got it chosen yet. We're just we're just starting that process. Do you know about what your timeline is for them? As soon as we can do it. <laughs> sorry. So, well, we were thinking about hiring our own. So. So, so I think if, if you're looking, you, you're going to want to do that anyway. You're going to want to verify if you're serious. But I mean, ours is trying to look at it. So, so our idea is to look at the entire footprint value, not specific parcels. But it'll be it'll be like a regional appraisal to give us a basis. So it won't take the place of a parcel by parcel. So I would I would not dissuade you from it. Protecting your own interest there. Yeah. So. <coughs> okay. Any other questions? How about, how yes, about sir. Everybody that lives around this, if this is to be made, everybody that lives around there, downstream or below, or the people in the teams, all that, they all have to write a like to let the insurance. <laughs> Would that, that be into that? <laughs> I guess if I did that. So we have to, there's some very, and I guess take it for what it's worth, there's some very, very strict regulations on how you build a dam. Um, they categorize them class one, class two, class three. This would be a class one dam because there's people below it. And so it has a whole different um, set of rules for construction and safety. But nothing is for sure. So I, I, I would imagine like, <laughs> that's a good question. Yes. Do we know what the elevation of the, uh, the, the water surface would be on the west side of the village? Do we have any idea about that? You want like the actual elevation? It's like ninety. Can you? you mean the I can email it to you because we looked. We, we we looked at that, and I can, I would be lying to you if I tried to guess. But we do have a map that shows us. Roughly the feet yeah, of elevation above sea level. Elevation. Yeah. And then I can't remember exactly what it is on and that. And then that one. drone will have the actual ones. The ones that the study that's coming up that'll have the actual ones. I, I can share that. I, like I said, I'd be lying if I told you what it is now because we did that literally. It was Google Earth and a crayon to try to, and then we went through point by point, and then um, Dean Natali helped us with some GIS work a little more in depth. So we we can get that to you, but I, I'd be lying. <laughs> So, anybody else? Thank you guys for coming. Hey, there's appreciate lots the of desserts so, up here. Please grab some coffee. of that. Please. I can't take them all home. You got a container we take home? Yeah. Here's what you say. Yeah. Yeah. Are you from the Thirty-four people.
Yes. Uh, I appreciate you pointing me out. I put my hand up for 20 minutes. Oh, yes. Are you still living there in Las Mesillas? Yes, sir. Mogote. That's the original Mogote. Oh, is it? Yeah. No. No. Well, Mogote is now it used to be uh, it was Casa, uh, Plaza de San Juan. Plaza de San Juan? I don't know. Plaza de San Juan is where Mogote is now. And on the other where I live is the original Mogote. The original Mogote. Yeah, but it got changed because uh, it was even near the mesa and put it last I've been to your house. I don't know if you remember me. I wore a badge at the time. No, I don't remember. Where did you go with? I was under Joe Taylor's administration. Joe Taylor? Where did you go? I worked under Joe. Oh. Where did you go with Sorry, this is still recording. I didn't mean to record you guys.